This is my fourth drought in California. There was 76, 77. Uh, which uh, really bit deep, it didn't last very long. I was a graduate student getting bit by the water bug. Uh, I, I wound up writing a PhD dissertation at UCLA in economics on the evolution of California groundwater law. That's when I got bit by the water bug. Be careful, don't let it bite you, it never lets go. Um, and then I was very much a professional water manager in 1985. I went to work for the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. I was there for 22 years, uh, experienced the 80s, 1987 to 1992 drought. It was a drought that looked a lot like the design drought that you, which was 1928 to 1934, a six, seven year drought that the projects were designed to allow you to manage against them. That was the worst we had in recorded history. 87 and 92 came along and guess what? We didn't manage very well against it. Even uh, the great and powerful Metropolitan Water District in Southern California went to mandatory rationing in 1991. It was not fun. It hurt the economy. It upset political relationships that are still screwed up uh, all these many years later. <clears throat> and we vowed never again, and by, by, by and large, MWD is not going through it ever again. We can talk about that in question and answers. They're, they spend $4 billion wisely, and they're in pretty good shape, and there's a big lesson there, I think, for how do we manage the system uh, for competing purposes and what's happened down south of the Tehachapi Mountains. We had an 07, 08 drought, which didn't, I, I, the, the, you might, you, how many remember, people remember Governor Schwarzenegger declaring a drought emergency in 2009? Couple of you. Uh, you know what? I, I was limited. I, I barely remember it. It's, it's like that drought didn't really happen. This drought again. I, I wanted to show you a couple of uh, a, a couple of shots. Whoops. There we go. Um, the, the two slides. This one I wanted to show you. I listened to the. To, this tells you how important water is these days to the state of California. I was one of two people on Channel 10 asked to to comment on the governor's state of the state address. I'm a water guy. Uh, but the, the media has picked this issue out, and by the way, if, if it stays as dry as it has been, you won't be reading about anything in California except water when we get to uh, uh, July, August, September. Water's going to be the only thing that's in your newspapers or in your media. But I, I, I actually like the governor's state of the state address a lot. Um, this, the words at the top there, we will build for the future, not steal from it. I think the governor's thinking both ecosystem and economy. Not a bad place to, uh, uh, to start thinking about the topic at hand. And he, the water portion of his speech was only about 175 words. Uh, we couldn't get advanced copies because, you know, he writes his own state of the state speech. Staff doesn't write it. He writes it himself. You can't get advanced copies. This is crazy. Uh, and he was talking so fast I could hardly write it down. Uh, and I was in the green room at uh, the television station. Um, but he, with respect to water, he's had two things that bear on today's discussion. He said, one, we've got to do what we can to deal with the crisis uh, that we're having this year. And second, we have to take this to invest, uh, as a lesson to invest in comprehensive water strategies. Governor's right on both counts. This is the last one I'll show you. Uh, that's me standing on Martin Luther King Day at what's supposed to be the, I'm supposed to be 100 feet underwater. This is Folsom Reservoir. I live not far from there in El Dorado Hills. If you, if, if you intend to be serious about water policy, Drive, it's, it's a 30, 40 minute drive, park your car, walk out on that, on, on that lake bed and think about what's going on in this state right now. Because again, this is my fourth drought as a Californian. I have never seen anything close to this. It is scary, scary dry. Uh, uh, but uh, the, uh, and this, by the way, that's the dam, the main fault, the dam at Folsom. Sorry, this was taken on my iPhone, so it's not a great picture. There is not a drop of water coming up to uh, butt up against uh, that dam. There's a, a saddle dam that's off to your left here. Not a, uh, water not, doesn't come within 500 feet of that, uh, of that saddle dam. Uh, Folsom barely deserves to be called a puddle today. Uh, and how you're doing in California depends upon two things. One is how prepared you are. How much money have you spent over the last 20 years? We, we do things in decades in California water. Uh, those that have spent a lot and are lucky enough to be able to draw on a, on a diverse set of watersheds, they'll manage their way through this drought like they're supposed to. I mean, the droughts are supposed to come and go in California without biting into the fabric of your economy. And in Southern California, that's exactly what will happen. I actually went down there a week and a half ago, met with the general manager, my old boss, and said, can you please tell the truth differently? Uh, and, and, and hopefully he will. He was quoted in the Sacramento Bee saying, we have plenty of water. And I asked Jeff not to use the word plenty for at least three years. <laughs> um, uh, but, but more importantly, what, what I think we did, look, we're going to struggle through 2014. 
When it's this bad, you don't do any, the struggle is what you wind up doing. The governor's use his emergency powers. That's important. Uh, that can move, we have, we, we have got pockets of pain all throughout the state of California. Some of them are seriously, serious pockets of pain. The, on, at the front of the urban list of people in need are po folks who supply water to the Sacramento metropolitan area. They're, they're de very dependent upon a single watershed, the American River. And the American River, that's where I'm standing on the main uh, uh, storage facility on the American River. Uh, they're about to, they, they could see their water supply literally dry up. Uh, and then they'll, they'll, by the way, if that happens, they'll find ways to piece things together to move water from the groundwater districts that'll be okay to the surface water districts, which won't be okay. Uh, the, a governor's emergency powers are enormous. He can order that to happen without compensation. Uh, I was uh, one of the key architects of Pete Wilson's drought water bank in 1991, which was the first really powerful experiment in water marketing in, in the state of California. Then Wilson declared his emergency powers. Never had to use them, not a single time. Once a governor does that, it's amazing how people cooperate with each other. Uh, and I think we need to have the same sort of intense scrutiny by this administration to get us through this year. The governor can order water molecules from this point to that point uh, under any, pretty much any terms that he wants. Uh, this will have an effect to cause people to really want to work together in a spirit of camaraderie, I hope, uh, to manage through this crisis. More important, we have to do as a state what Southern California has done as a region. Uh, and that is spend a lot of money on a diversified portfolio. Uh, we, we, I don't want to make it sound like we haven't done any of that. We have over the last 20, 25 years, not just in Southern California. It's happened elsewhere, although I would argue not nearly as much. Uh, the uh, one word of caution, and this is something that my organization has been telling the governor and this administration for some time, you have to, just, you have to stop talking about the Delta only. Uh, for, so, for, for so many years, it was the tunnels, the tunnels, the tunnels. Uh, it, I, I have a constituency, they don't all like those tunnels. Uh, I, I represent agencies above the Delta, below the Delta, in the Delta. They're not all tunnel fans, uh, uh, believe it or not. Uh, and at one point in March, I was up in the Sacramento Valley and realizing my members were about to sue, go, to, go to court over the Bay Delta Conservation Plan. I believe that they were doing that because the, because the tunnels was the only thing that the governor seemed to care about. And if the tunnels is the only thing you're moving forward, get ready for a fight, because my members will be at each, each other's throats. And our solution to that, I, I worked for a 36-member board of directors. The solution to that was don't just talk about the tunnels. Talk about a truly comprehensive approach, because that's what it's going to take to solve this problem in California. Very briefly, and then I'll set, the state, uh, I'll, I'll set down for, uh, for my good friend Jay. Uh, local resource investment, Southern California has reduced their demands for Delta water by 25% over the last 20 years. Uh, they were selling 2.4 million of imported water in 1990. Their, their demands now have stabilized at about 1.8 million. What did they do with that 600,000 every year? They put it into storage. They invested th roughly three billion dollars in the storage element alone, probably four to five billion dollars in their uh, total effort. They've now got 2.4 million acre feet of water in storage that did not exist in 1992. Uh, and that is why they will be able to weather this through. And when you're going to be reading in the newspapers about a terrible fight in Washington, D.C., where the environmentalists and the farmers and everybody at each other's throats over relaxing standards and other things, Southern California can take a pass. I, 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 think, I don't think they'll show up on either side of that debate. They'll just lock the door and not answer it uh, when, when, when people come and knock. Uh, Jeff Keitlinger will return Diane Feinstein's calls very politely, but he's going to stay out of this fight if he possibly can, because he doesn't need to fight this fight. He's ready for what's happening. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the rest of the state you know, needs to be t t taking notes. Uh, starts with demand reduction. You have to invest in storage. For those of you who are storage skeptics, you are making one of the biggest mistakes of your professional life. Uh, if you just invest in that unit of, con of conservation or recycling, when the dry time comes, you've got one unit. If you invest in storage, and so there's four out of five years when uh, you're not dry, what do you do with that water that's not getting consumed? Well, if you're a water manager, you put it into storage. And then when the dry year comes, you have not one unit of storage, but four or five units of storage, and that is why MWD is okay. Uh, we have to invest in, our, in, in habitat restoration, watersheds. My region three members, those are folks above the rim dams and the Sierra. They're huge on getting people to look at watersheds differently. Uh, I've been coming for some years to your watershed center. Uh, the point here is it's got to be a, 
a, a, a broad, comprehensive, statewide solution. We need to move the whole thing forward. Resist temp temptation, oh, that's too complicated. Let me just focus on this part. That is sure death to any water policy, to just pick out the favorite uh, policy and try to move it forward. We have to move the whole thing forward. That's certainly where my community is coming from. I'll end on a kind of a positive note. Uh, we pulled this together through Aqua when, when my members were threatening to sue each other and asked, I, my response to that was let's not sue each other, let's present to the governor our own statewide water plan, something that we think, by the way, didn't have a lot of new ideas. These ideas have been kicking around for, uh, but, but what we have now, is we're going on, a, I, I think we'll get to 100 agencies around the state that have endorsed this comprehensive statewide uh, uh, approach and are prepared to put their political weight into making it happen. And that'll give us the tools the next time around to handle this thing better. I'm over my five or six or seven, but, uh, but. Uh, keep, you know, we need a filibuster. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll set the stage for Jay. Look very much forward to back and forth. Yeah. Before you sit down, I, the one thing I do want to hear is sort of Aqua's view of trying to balance. And I'm sorry, we, we will do question and answer, but this is the one thing I wanted to pr prod him on in the beginning. Trying to balance right now in a state of crisis when there's so little water within this, this the notion of the ecosystem demands, Endangered Species Act requirements, Clean Water Act requirements, and the economy. When it gets this bad, when the system is this dry, I don't know that balance makes a lot of sense. They're, I mean, to me, the, they're going to there's going to be a knock them down, drag them out in Washington D.C., and they're fighting over water that doesn't exist. You're fighting over the, there is no water in this system to fight over. Now, what I wish, what I wish, my friend, is that we had a couple million acre feet stored, that could be shared between the environment and uh, and and the farmers and. Others, if, if, if we had done that, and by, by the way, you could have stored a lot in 2011. There were, your, uh, MWD increased its storage account. They, they pulled them down in 2007, 2008 by about a million acre feet. Uh, by the way, I've got just again, true disclosure, and I, I'm, I'm working hard to not let the pride show through because a lot of this stuff happened under my direction when I was a, a manager at MWD. I uh, spent a lot of years negotiating these storage arrangements and marketing arrangements, et cetera. But they pulled storage down in 2007, 2008 pretty dry. Not that dry, but pretty dry, by a million acre feet. And in 2009, 10, and 11, they added 1.7 million acre feet to those storage accounts, which are now at 2.4 million. Uh, uh, so even, and the way their math works, even if they get three dry years in a, three years of zero allocation in a row, they'll still have storage left over at the end of that third year. So when Jeff Keitlinger was driving me crazy, saying, well, we'll be okay in 2016, I wanted to strangle the guy. Uh, but then I started doing the math, realizing, well, he's right, but he can talk about it different. <laughs> um, in, 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 look, in a year this bad, d d d balancing is very hard. You need to have been prepared in advance to help yourself balance during a year like this. Uh, and we did partly. Some parts of the state did. As a state, we didn't. And so as a state, we will suffer this year. But we don't have to suffer. Uh, again, I, I, as a state, they need to do what the MWD managers did in 1992 and swear never again and then invest to make it true. Thanks. So let me pass it over to Jay. So, so Jeff, thank you. Um, as I get started here, I have to say I was going to—I was planning to just throw a lot of science out and kind of make things up and make Tim's head spin. But I have two of my <laughs> favorite marine science resources in the room: Rod Kelsey from the Nature Conservancy, Mike Diaz in the back. So now I'm—I have to wash clean on all that. So I've, I've got to be genuinely honest. I, yeah, exactly. So at least I, I love the symmetry of Tim on the right and me on the left here, so I should probably stay on this side. Um, as Jeff noted, uh, my day job is at the Nature Conservancy. I run our policy group uh, in Sacramento. Probably more than half of my time is spent uh, on water policy issues. Another part of it uh, that I uh, am very appreciative to Tim's leadership on is keeping hope alive on a water bond in 2014, and uh, which I think is absolutely critical to initiate a series of important water management reforms, some of what Tim talked about. And uh, we would have some important um, monitoring and better management of water resources and really looking at a more comprehensive water budget in California as a part of those conditions as well. The totality of my job is really to think about reconciliation ecology. I mean, I feel like this could also be the nature conservancy or rationalization for ecology, one or the other. So uh, that's, not, that's sort of an inside joke, I guess. But uh, 
uh, a part of this is really how do you make it work? How do you make how do you get people to buy in to conservation? And um, Dr. Moyle is here, who got us really actually grounded in this subject of how do you. Uh, if you can't really fix a system and bring it back to what it was and really restore those, all of those natural values, how can you get that system as close to functionality again? And, um, and, and my argument today, and I hope we really kind of delve into this conversation, is that in essence, I'm the chief political scientist for the Nature Conservancy in California. And these are the enabling conditions that I need in order to think about making restoration ecology work. And I just want to, I'm going to kind of go through my presentation fairly quickly. I think I've got the right one to go through. This is California as a biodiversity mosaic. Um, the green values here represent uh, uh, sort of an index of multiple ecosystem values. Um, the Nature Conservancy started its work in the far northwestern corner of California. And then that was some 50 years ago in California. Today, 50 years later, several hundred million dollars later, and uh, several million acres put into conservation um, as a strategic fabric from uh, the deserts to the North Coast and the Central Valley. And then, as you said, so what I've done here is to integrate areas that are prioritized for conservation or dedicated for conservation with areas that are in development, either in agriculture or urban landscapes. Um, and the gray mosaic that ties it all together is really the space that the Nature Conservancy is working in today. It's about finding partnerships with ranchers, with agricultural operations, with water agencies, with uh, urban planning agencies, you name it, but finding multiple values that we can put together in order to have a place in nature uh, for people. Um, I, Tim and I are on a lot of panels where we talk about the Delta, so I thought I would prepare uh, a little bit of what the San Francisco Bay used to be like, this uh, tidal wetlands in the 1850s. And this is what's left. And the Nature Conservancy today is active in trying to restore a mosaic of habitats, intertidal wetland habitat, up freshwater tidal conditions, and trying to bring, we'll never get to the, we'll never get there, but we have a path working in the delta to strategically find areas to restore that to begin to restore or to get to that point that Peter has described of reconciliation ecology, bringing those habitat types back that can restore conditions for 11 threatened and endangered fisheries throughout the Delta. Can we, are we going to save all of them? Probably not. But we can, working together, get to the dual goals that I again have to compliment Tim as a, as a leader in California. My initial experience at the Nature Conservancy was 2009, working on the dual goals of California water policy, to reduce reliance on the delta as a source of water supply, and to begin restoration ecology, to begin this putting together this mosaic of interrelated habitat types that have been decimated over time in the delta, to get to that reconciliation ecology framework. Now, where you come from on this, I think, is always interesting. The, sli the first slide I raised here was about economics and politics. And so Tim's constituencies, especially those south of the Delta, see the world in this lens. Wow. Um, actually, this is, so th they look at this with some degree of panic, that what do the environment, where do the environmentalists want to take us? Do they want to take us back here or we're seeing these tapering exports. Is there something that could get us back here? And, that, and BDCP is supposed to find a balance. And the Nature Conservancy has been involved in this now going on seven years. So the Bay Delta Conservation Plan is what I'm talking about for those of you that don't live this every day. Um, and, and, and it's an elusive balance. Um, Jeff worked closely with us with a group principally of UC Davis scientists. and. Uh, 
trying to answer some of the hardest questions about how we get back to a point of balance in the delta. This, over time, as you look at from especially 1990, the water community would look at this and say, our exports are on a trend line going forward, especially from 2000, that is increasingly unreliable with respect to water supply. We understand that, but what's reliable? And I think that's another area that I would love to open for questions as we go forward today. Another entirely different model on reconciliation ecology, uh, as I think about reconciliation ecology. How much are you willing to invest in the flyway? How important is the flyway? Well, from my organization's point of view, it's absolutely essential to biodiversity on the West Coast. And if we lose it, um, we are losing uh, a great part of who we are as people. And we're losing, in all respects, probably an attachment to grow the conservation community to actually enable the kinds of conditions we need to work together on broader environmental issues. Um, is this worth, is this system worth 10 million a year? Is it worth 20 million a year? You know, how much are you willing to invest in sustaining this balance? And we're not asking for new investment per se in the system, but we absolutely need water in order for those refuges to function in the flyway. And so we're looking at these values, economic values, political values, social values, and moral values about who we are, and are we willing to make these investments over time? Can I get Tim's water agencies in the San Joaquin Valley to dedicate a certain amount of water to keep these refuges viable? And this is one of the things that I lose sleep on. I mean, not because it's Tim, because frankly he's a great partner, but we're going to have to give a little in order to keep these resources alive. And we're going to have to give in the delta in order to keep the delta alive. Another example, Klamath River system. How many of you are tracking the Klamath, Klamath Basin issues? It's, I think it's one of the most fascinating ecological challenges along with the delta, along with can we sustain the flyway resources necessary um, in California? to do our part for the Pacific Flyway. Every year, the Klamath has this trade-off. Do we provide refuges? Do we pr provide wef refuge water at the mouth of the Klamath? How do we provide adequate water uh, uh, for the salmon runs? And there is uh, the Klamath Basin Settlement Agreement and the Klamath Basin Reclamation Act, which is just sitting there in Congress. Nobody thinks it's a possibility this year. Perhaps the Oregon delegation is ready to assert some leadership and really spend political capital to make it happen. That will be more than a billion dollar investment. It's worth a try. I mean, I, it's interesting to look around the room. I see some of you, and we've debated the details of this now and then. Um, but are we going to be willing to make that investment in order to give reconciliation ecology a chance in the Klamath Basin. I mean, this is, there are a lot of tough decisions along the way here. It means taking out dams, and we don't have time. This is a coho salmon. I don't know if any of you saw it yesterday. The uh, San Francisco Chronicle actually ran a story that uh, the fate of the coho, at least uh, this triennial run, is in the balance could well go extinct this year due to the drought. So this is really heavy stuff. And I appreciate the chance to come kind of open this discussion today. Um, we can't make progress without compromise. Everybody has to give up something here. And I think we can do it. Our organization is certainly committed to this. Uh, Seven years investment in the BDCP process is a part of that. Um, and we look forward to an open dialogue with all of the stakeholders, and especially Tim and his community. And I, I do think that out of 2009 comes a foundation from which we have to keep making progress. That formally embracing the dual goals in the Delta 
is really a foundational public policy point from which we should be able to turn the corner and give reconciliation ecology a chance. And so with apologies to Dr. Moyle and where I've <laughs> taken this, um, I uh, look forward to a broad, wide open dialogue with you. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Jared. Jay, why don't, we, why don't we sit on the table? Yes, sir. So, uh, I, I want to start by asking these two guys a reconciliation question uh, for you to respond to. Let me set up a reconciliation conundrum for you, and I'll give two of them. One in the Klamath Basin, one in Sacramento here, and how you view it. The first is in the Klamath Basin, <coughs> where you want to hold water back to support the suckers and have a, have a higher lake level. And of course, you have farmers who are using that water back there. But you also want to release more water downstream to support coho salmon and Chinook salmon in particular uh, downstream. So this is, this is one of those classic species trade-offs that we know reconciliation ecology sets us up to, to at least think about. And then the second one, which is much more familiar to both of you, is we have two listed species of salmon in the Sacramento system, the winter run and spring run Chinook salmon, uh, in particular entirely dependent upon cold water releases from reservoirs. At the same time, we need, starting in a couple of days, to bump up releases out of those reservoirs for something, for delta smelt and water being smelt in the delta. These are classic gut-wrenching trade-offs and I just want to hear what you guys' view of this. I mean, I, so you're in charge of, uh, of having to deal with this. I, I just want to hear what Tim has to right, well, he's, he's got a <laughs> Actually, you know what? Let's, let's do this to you, Jay. You've got a microphone. Yeah. Oh. Jay has a microphone. So, boy, there are no good answers to those questions. So I'll say, so I'm for both. It's, uh, no, I mean, I think that the only way uh, I had the great fortune to work with Bruce Babbitt at the Interior Department. And his approach to these problems was to lock everybody in a room and until you come out with a solution. And on both of these things, Jeff, I don't think, I, I'm not in the business of picking winners and losers on which fish is more important. Um, and I just, uh, or, you know, in the, in the Klamath, is the water for salmon more important than uh, than the water uh, for birds, and you know, and it seems that you know, I, I don't know of a way that we can really deal with these issues short of putting everybody in a room and trying to develop the kinds of incentives. I think, from a practical standpoint. I prefer working further upstream first and trying to get people to enter forbearance agreements to give up some of those water rights in exchange for some form of payment, some, some con conservation easement on that water right and to see who you can incentivize to actually participate in a program uh, where you prioritize and bring more flexibility by starting upstream first and working your way down. And I am particularly challenged in the Delta now. I mean, I, you know, this is uh, Delta water quality versus what's going to happen in the cold water pool. And, and I don't think, I mean, we can all hope this is, the, this is a one-year drought. And you know, the only thing I would take issue with on anything you said is we don't know if we're in the third year of a five-year drought or, or a six-year drought, drought or a ten-year drought. And so this is one of those cases where I probably am on the other side of most in the conservation community. And I'm going to say, man, I don't want to stress the delta. But I, don't, I, I just don't have enough faith until we have that resource with some flexibility upstream that we can spend it now. And so I, I just, so that's where I guess as a conservation practitioner, I, I, that's how I would approach it. So, this is reconciliation. Yeah. You go. I was in those rooms with Bruce Babbitt. Uh, I, miss, I miss Bruce uh, almost daily. Uh, be, be, Babbitt believed in investing in a, in a co-equal future. We didn't invent the term until 2009, but that's where, that's where Bruce was about. He was scared to death that if ESA was uh, accused of taking down the California economy, that that would be very bad for the Endangered Species Act and the politics in Washington, D.C., <coughs> and he viewed it as one of the legacies he wanted to be behind. He, he, Bruce strongly felt the Endangered Species Act was a very powerful tool for 
uh, with the topic we're talking about today, and he wanted to protect it by making it work. Uh, and you, it had to work for the economic interest as well as for the environmental interest, which is something that Secretary Babbitt, in my experience, believed deeply in, in, in his soul. Uh, and I've got to tell you, I don't, I don't run into people like that uh, all that often. I think, I think uh, the Nature Conservancy comes from that, but a whole lot of the other folks that uh, Bruce is gone now, and you don't exactly get the feeling that that's where the federal government is coming from all the time these days. To answer your, uh, your question about you know, the, the, this species versus that species, uh, again, as I said in my remarks, under the circumstances we've got today, you're pretty much uh, facing the problem that Abraham faced. You want to slice the baby in two and hope that a miracle happens. Uh, but we're in a situation where there are no easy choices. Uh, but, there, but, but that doesn't mean that that's where we have to be in the future. Uh, and uh, the, I'm, I'm, I'm more an infrastructure person than a lot of you probably are, but I see infrastructure as being melded to uh, demand management strategies that would create a lot more resources under these circumstances. What if we had invested in storage, not just in Southern California, but in Northern California? And it wasn't just MET that had 2.4 million acre feet that they could manage right now, but we had that available to us for co-equal goals up here on the American River and, uh, and elsewhere. And, and the path to get there is a truly comprehensive path. You'll notice in my direct remarks, I didn't even mention the Delta. Now, five years ago, it would have been all I would have talked about. but. Uh, but we have, we, we, and I think the most important thing we need is leadership. The kind of leadership that we had from Bruce Babbitt was somebody who really gets it that we have to make it work for both the economic sector and the environmental sector. You've got to get these people to figure out what is your investment strategy, how are you going to raise the money, how are you going to spend the money. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that the, that the answers are there. Uh, uh, but but we've, got to re we've got to reconcile ourselves to the fact that we have to work together and both sides of the equation have to truly care about what happens to the other side. And right now we're playing this big game of gotcha. Uh, every time something changes, one side or the other tries to figure out how to turn it into gotcha. I got your water. No, I got your water. Uh, and, and we need to be investing in our water if we're going to be in, a, in, a, in better shape in the future. We're not quite there. I, think, I do think it'll take uh, uh, enormous leadership. Maybe. You know, maybe Jerry Brown's got uh, got what it takes. I don't know. He's an interesting guy to deal with. Yeah. <laughs> okay, questions. Um, so you said that we have to invest in uh, building up more storage. Would that mean building up reservoirs? And if that is the case, then wouldn't that um, go against some of the goals that a lot of the colleges have? Like having a very hybrid engineering system is not good for the ecosystem? A great question, and yeah. well, it's. I just advocated for more storage, and she's interpreted that to mean dams, which it does in part, uh, but it also means more recycling, more ocean desal, all those other things working together. And aren't those investments in infrastructure what caused the problems with the system in the first place? A great question, and it's the, you know, in, in that it's that kind of that it's that kind of perspective that we need to be. Molding, folding in here, because you know what? If this, if we were talking 1960s tile infrastructure, you'd be absolutely right. Uh, in the 1960s, the ground rule for building infrastructure was build low-cost water supply for a growing economy. That was the policy that we were b developing. Uh, when we sent the engineers out in 1960 to build the state water project, we said, we want cheap water for our economy. Can you do that? Harvey Banks said, sure can, and that's what he did. And today we deliver water out of the three-quarter inch tap, and the average cost of, is like two-tenths of a penny per gallon. Uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the stuff that you buy at 7-Eleven costs 6,000 times as much. We really succeeded in, in cheap water. The challenge today is, is infrastructure for co-equal goals. And I, I, I got to tell you, I've got more years under, on, on this chassis than I would like to have. I cannot, as an expert in this field who really believes in co-equal goals, I can't conceive of getting there without investing in modern t technology, uh, by which I mean some infrastructure, well, to other things. Uh, the, 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 the example I gave a little while, most of you would be wildly in favor of recycled water. Best resource we're going to have for our water supply uh, solutions in California today, we need to invest billions of dollars in recycled water. But if that's all you do, you, 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 it's hard to imagine how you, you manage yourself through something as deep as what we're doing, dealing with now, and there will be periods when we have to do that. If you marry that to storage and then operate the storage for both fishery purposes, 
the fish could use colder water, they could use a lot more water right now, but the system doesn't have it, have it to, uh, uh, to give it to. If <coughs> we hadn't built the dams, there wouldn't be a drop of water in the Sacramento River, or, well, maybe the Sacramento, but the American River would be just bone dry. The only water there is water that's been developed by human beings. So we have to completely reinvent how we think about infrastructure and how we work together. If we were going to build 1960s style infrastructure, you'd be right, but we can't do that. We need to build 21st century infrastructure, and I don't think we can solve the problem without it. So this is a great question, and so this is probably the most progressive guy on that question in the water community, So because most people in Tim's camp, forgive me on this generalization, <laughs> would say it is about structural solutions from the 1960s. And I think you're, what we have to move from is it can't just be about more dams. It's got to be about smarter overall water management. Re, you know, this year, we are going to hammer our groundwater basins throughout California. And the Nature Conservancy and others are doing very comprehensive analysis now on what that's going to mean. And in many cases, um, people look at the southern San Joaquin and say, well, that's got to be our priority for recharge. Well, those basins have subsided 20, 30 feet in the last 30 years. And we've got to look at holistically around the state and say, well, where are the opportunities for recharge? Where are there opportunities for conjunctive water management, where we're using some of that stored water more creatively to rewater groundwater basins and strike a better balance over time? And so I think it is not just a storage issue. And if we think about it in the way most of the water, uh, how do I say this nicely? Most of the water agency community thinks about it, we'll go down the wrong path. Um, but if we go down Tim's path, we'll have a lot of common ground to work on. But I just want to be cautionary that Tim's more in the middle on this than most of the water community in California. And it's, we, need a, we need a much smarter water management strategy with a lot more emphasis on groundwater storage um, than, than surface water storage. And we really need to look at much more integrated, truly integrated groundwater and surface water management. I mean, California really is an anomaly in the West in uh, aggressively accounting for surface water management uh, that's going down our rivers. And absolutely mindlessly delinking groundwater basins from the impacts that are, are, are occurring virtually every year through poor overall water accounting and poor water monitoring and in an adequate focus on truly integrated water management in California. And if we're serious about how we come out of this drought to really you know, think about the future and think about protecting kind of my side of the house or the ecological resources of California, as well as providing for a uh, more durable water supply for people's needs, then we've got to start thinking about it really as a water management challenge, not simply a water storage challenge. Because we can't really store our way out of this. I mean, we've got 42 plus million acre feet of water storage. And we've got uh, about 10 million acre feet of water behind all that storage right now. So, um, and, and, you know, and I am with you. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying surface storage is not a part of it, because that's not our position. I mean, we think that you know, we've really got to be smart. We've got to manage the system with greater flexibility. But it's bigger than just surface storage. It's much bigger than we that. We certainly agree on that. And but by the way, my, my fellow managers are more progressive than, than than Jay is giving them credit for. How many of you have participated in taking a dam down? I have. Oh, about 10 or 12. 10 or 12 dams I've been a part of uh, taking down in California. Most of it up in the Sacramento Valley, and all, well, most of the time in partnership with the Nature Conservancy. I have a photograph yeah. I'm very proud of with, I mentioned Bruce Babbitt, where he, we're both holding little 10-pound uh, sledges on the Western Canal Dam on Butte Creek. Uh, some dams need to come down. Some dams need to go up. Uh, in, in an era of co-equal goals. If, if, I'm, I'm taking the surface storage side of this. The first storage project I would start on if I was the king of the world in California uh, would be what I like to call a parking lot in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, and uh, to illustrate the point, uh, it's not a place where you hold the water for long periods of time. It's, it's, it would be designed to hold the water for six months. Uh, in March of 2011, delta outflow was 200,000 cubic feet per second. That's a lot of water. And guess what? Guess how much they were pumping at the bank's pumping plant? Zero. 
the pumping plant got shut down for days on end when you had 200,000 CFS of Delta outflow. Why? Because there was no place to put that water. All the groundwater basins, which have very large amounts of storage capacity in them, they were inundated with local stormwater. They couldn't take a drop of water and they wouldn't want to pay imported uh, 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 water fees. Uh, we, we don't have much surface storage south of the Delta at all. There's two million acre feet at San, uh, at San Luis. And then Diamond Valley Lake's got 400,000 acre feet on the top half of that reservoir. That's all the, the surface storage management capability we've got in the system. What I would like to have had at that point in time was a surface storage facility that could take water at 10,000 CFS when the Delta could afford it, park it there for six months, because in the summertime, Groundwater basins can take plenty of water. They're starving for water in the summertime. Uh, you needed something uh, <coughs> that, that the, the, and this is diff very different, by the way. The 1960 vision of storage was build storage on live streams on the North Coast rivers primarily, hold that water till it was dry, and move it. We, we, need, we have completely changed the storage strategy in California where it's don't park any water on a live stream up here. That's a no-no. Instead, you want to park the water off stream or in the groundwater basins and move uh, the storage lake closer to the population that's going to use it. But right now, we've got a system that doesn't allow us to do that because it wasn't plumbed with an eye towards Coequal Gulf. I like where it's going now. Here we go. The question was the balance between regional management and statewide management. Um, you, we obviously have to have, the answer to your question is check the box next to uh, all of the above. We need both. Uh, I would argue very strongly that over the last 25 years, we've had a lot of regional management going on in California. Uh, the regional water managers have not been sitting on their uh, on their hands. They have been very active. Again, I was, I, I know a lot about what's happened south of the Tehachapi Mountains because I was part of it, uh, but regional managers really move the ball a great deal. And it bothers me when people act like, well, we haven't done anything for 25 years. We have done a lot uh, at the region level. We haven't added that statewide interface. So, I mean, as much as you try, I know that there's this, many people have this vision. We'll just, we'll get regional management and then we can all walk away from our import systems. Well, I don't think I'm ever going to live in that world. Uh, uh, it, and I'm not sure I'd want to live in that world for, for what it's worth. Uh, it, we've gotten to a point in California now where we need the statewide system to take a step up and match itself to what we can do at the, re, uh, at the regional system. The water's going to be developed regionally. Um, it, it, you know, they may have to give back a little, uh, they sure as hell don't want to, but they may have to give back a little bit. But the water of the future is going to be developed locally. It's going to be developed in people's backyards. But we will continue to, to, to operate the, the system that we inherited from our grandparents, millions of acre feet, and we'll need to come out of that system. And that system has to be retrofitted because it was designed back when engineers thought only about cheap water and not about the, uh, about the ecosystem at the same time. And I oftentimes... When I worked at MWD, I would tell myself, what would Harvey Banks do? Yeah, he, was a, he was a brilliant uh, 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 civil engineer, and he was ordered to produce a cheap water supply system, and he did an outstanding job. What if Harvey had been asked to, uh, 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 to, to, to design a system for the coequal goals and then uh, figured out a way that we actually measure coequal goals? He would have developed a very, very different system. He wouldn't have built any on-stream reservoirs. That would never have been part of the State Water Project. He would have planned reservoir storage off-stream or underground, wherever you could. Uh, uh, he wouldn't have made the Priffle Canal the last thing in the system. He would have made it one of the first things in the system uh, because that's truly a system. If you really want a system of coequal goals, for God's sakes, don't put those great big pumps at the wrong end of the delta. It's a huge, huge mistake uh, if, you, if you're a coequal planner. It was fine if you're a cheap water planner. They didn't, build, they didn't build the canal then, which is nothing more than a 10% extension of the canals that carry water south. They didn't build it then because they wanted to save the money. Because uh, cheap water was what the system was about back then. If you'd have really cared about coequal goals, it would have been one of the first things that you would have built. And we're, again, we're, 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 we are, I would argue, in a generation that needs to be asking ourselves, what would Harvey Banks have built? And now let's figure that out and go about building it and operating it and, and investing in conservation at the same time. <laughs> um, how does a restored salmon habitat and a restored um, flyway contribute to an agricultural problem? How would that help support agricultural support the agricultural economy? But that, yeah, that's the essence of the question. How do I strike? So if I'm so you're asking me if I'm dedicating water for refuges and I'm dedicating water for flows for salmon. 
um, I'm leaving the implication is that the water supply for agriculture is going to be threatened, right? Fair enough? Okay. So my response to that is, again, we've got to think more holistically about all this. That um, I, I just think we have taken salmon to the brink. We have um, you know, certainly um, seriously impaired the values of the Pacific Flyway as a migratory bird corridor um, because we're drying it up. And so in a sense, what you're asking is a social choice, but I'm going to make it a little bit I think there is a win-win there, frankly. If we look at agriculture in the Sacramento River Basin, for example, I think that we can achieve partnerships with growers to actually leave water in f fields longer in the wintertime for the benefit of migratory birds and provide the right kind of incentives to do that and actually support groundwater recharge at the same time. And, um, and, and does that, and that holds a little water for fish, yeah, but, um, but over time, if we're, if we're actually, one of the things I talked about was the importance of monitoring outcomes. And if we're monitoring groundwater resources and really with integrity saying that's a sustainable basin, then we're, everybody that operates there, everyone in agriculture is going to have a much better sense of that. And what I will say is that I think that not every region is equal. I think that if there were some San Joaquin Valley growers here, they'd say, what, what's, what's the most painful lesson that we're learning out of this drought? We're going to have to fa fallow some land in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, and there is no way that we can continue to support the kinds of water use um, in the San Joaquin Valley that we've ex historically experienced. And you're seeing that in um, subsidence. You're seeing that in the loss of um, uh, uh, viable farmland over time and drainage issues throughout the valley. And there are certain issues that we're going to have to come to terms with. And so I guess what I'm saying is let's look at Certainly, let's look at the Sacramento Valley and say, I think that we can actually achieve multiple goals a whole lot better um, with the water that we've got and be more honest about where it's going and account for it better. And then we do have some hard choices to make because what we've been doing for the last 30 years in increasing and hardening water demand um, by growing more and more pistachios and more and more almonds and more and more grapes um, uh, has created an unsustainable situation. And, and even if you took away any interest in providing water for ecology, you're still going to reach the same conclusion that we can't stay on the same path that we're in in the San Joaquin Valley. So I just think we, must ha we have to have a bigger, deeper conversation about where and how we're using water and be much more honest about where we're using that water and what are the long-term effects of that water use, um, and be more transparent about where the water is and where it isn't. So I, I do think a part of this approach is that we've got to be more direct and honest with each other and, uh, and, and really f put a foundation of open and transparent uh, hydrology and biological science and, uh, and uh, water management decisions um, into the public debate. And I do think that's one of the benefits that we get out of a drought, is that we are going to have a much more open conversation about these issues, because it's going to affect everybody's life in this room and everything that you care about, about being a Californian. And that's what I'm looking for. That's the only thing I'm looking forward to about this drought, is that um, <laughs> there need to be more questions like that. We were told that frogs do well. <laughs> For a while. Tim, I want you to respond to one of the things that Jay has said, because you, you speak with very positive tone about we're going to solve this problem by working hard and restoring everything else, but how do you deal with this co concept of co-equal goals when we're in a net annual deficit of one and a half to two million feet in the Tulare Basin? I mean, what miracle occurs? He's referring to the groundwater over there. Yeah, I'm referring to the groundwater. What miracle occurs that solves that problem and then also Yes, it's toward the Um, water. Yeah. Is there water? I have no idea. There's no water here. <laughs>
that question was so tough it, ch it chased Jay out of the room. <laughs> um, for what it's worth, uh, the, the, you know, the Jeff's asking a really good question. I mean, uh, this is one of the ghosts of Christmas past that's coming to visit us is this groundwater situation in the valley. I wish it wasn't the driest year on record going in with record low storage. Uh, that's not a time when I want to go to my members and say use less, uh, use less groundwater. I'm not sure anybody can survive that uh, this year. But I will tell you, that, tell you that there is a growing recognition in the San Joaquin Valley, certainly amongst water managers, and I think even amongst the growers, that the situation is not sustainable and they have to get real about it. Uh, I was uh, recently a speaker down in, in uh, San Luis Obispo for a, for a, uh, a, a grammar <coughs> program there. Mostly it was growers, grape, grape growers. And they were saying words like meters and measure and tax and restrict and cut back on demands. Uh, and, and, and no spears were passing from one side of the room or the other. Uh, everyone seemed to survive. I'd never heard that kind of dialogue before. Uh, and I, 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 most of my, much of my water career was in Southern California where they're quite used to all these things about managing their groundwater basin. That's not true generally north. There's a few exceptions, but uh, not generally true, and nearly as true north of the Tehachapi Mountains. That very day, I went over to Tulare. To Tulare, I was a speaker at a conference on groundwater, and they actually had groundwater overdraft. They put the word overdraft in their uh, conference title. That was very meaningful to me, because uh, <coughs> I can remember when DWR came out with Bolton 118 in the early 1980s, I was just breaking into this business. It was put out there by a wonderful wo woman named Jean Peterson, who was in charge of uh, the, the DDR stuff. And I tell you, she, she had to hide in the caves for six <laughs> months uh, because she put, she put a, you've probably all seen this map, it was critically overdrafted uh, groundwater basins in California. And for just putting that ma map in a public av available document, this was heresy. Uh, I, think the, I think the crowd is realizing they're watching subsidence. In some places, it's five feet in the last few years. Uh, SAC Dam, that's the diversion structure for uh, the Central California Irrigation District, one of the biggest, oldest, most senior water rights uh, folks down there. Uh, the SAC Dam elevation went down by eight inches uh, over the course of uh, 20, so a, a year or some roughly 2013. Um, they are changing the floodplains on the San Joaquin River, which means the next time it, the river hits a flood, different people are going to be damaged. Lawsuits are going to start, uh, if, if we don't force it politically, I believe it will be forced in the courts uh, because the system is doing real economic damage uh, and we have to. And I think all of it is this uh, realistically, what can we sustain over the long term? I'm a bit more optimistic than you might. Uh, thank I, I because again, right, I, I, I didn't start out in my career to be an infrastructure person. I swear I didn't. Um, and, and I'm not an infrastructure person today. I believe in truly integrated uh, 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 solutions. But I also have come to do some visioning out there that if we really invest in that true integrated, truly smart 21st century infrastructure with smart demand reduction, uh, uh, and that uh, we can probably sustain more in California than we realize. Yeah, well, actually, let me just, on, on this point, I, I, I do want to say that it's not just me saying this either. And I, I've been spending a little time the last few weeks in the southern San Joaquin Valley. And it's encouraging to me that a number of farmers have come up to me and said, that's the lesson we're taking away from this. And so I, I do think that that dialogue is kind of setting in. And, and it's sort of that sense of, Wow, we got hard choices, and there's no way we've got enough water to stretch across this ma much land, and to try to do it every year um, uh, with crops that are dependent upon having water every year. Just there's just no way to do it. But, uh. So I have a follow-up to this kind of answer really quick. Um, and the way that Michael Rosenzweig talks about reconciliation ecology, mm -hmm. something that makes me excited about it is that it involves stakeholders. It involves people planting something in their backyard and being very directly involved with the process. Um, and so both of you mentioned that people are starting to realize that the current that the current way we're doing things is not sustainable. Um, and you mentioned something about diversion dams going down, subsidence. Do you think it's just being faced with this really dramatic drought? Or do you think that there's more information or a change in the political conversation? What do you think is drawing people into really at that base level that things change in mind? I think the physical world's changing, and they can't ignore it anymore. They would, they would ignore it if they could. They'd love to continue to live with their head in the sand. But they're realizing that so much has happened. I, in the world for San Joaquin Valley, agriculture uh, started to change big time, 1992. 
uh, Halloween, October 31st, George H.W. Uh, Bush signed the uh, Center Valley Project Improvement Act. It was the first announcement in California water. Uh, people still don't like, I worked for MWD and we were for the act, by the way. Shh. <laughs> 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 uh, and I worked for a brilliant man named Carl Baranke, and Carl was all about the, uh, that legislation because he wanted access to CVP water for water marketing purposes. He wanted that water to flow in the Southern California. They never got a drop of that water, by the way, not a, not a single drop. Um, and I, I was one of his chief lieutenants, and what I saw happening was we were moving towards critical goals, and that's what we had to do. Uh, and I, th I, and I th there, again, there are more people who think like me than you might think, uh, but that's where we are headed uh, for the future. And the faster we get there, the better off we'll be. Yeah. I think more people are thinking about climate change, which was the other element that I had on mm -hmm. my big equation on this, and that uh, you know, we're going to have to get ready for these boom and bust cycles of uh, weather um, on a much more regular basis in uh, the world in which we're trying to live. And I, I feel like there is also a sense that um, we got to figure this out, and and I think that you have to have a crisis sometimes in order to really face things, and and it's uh, I think that's the you know that's the best part of being in a crisis is that I think we do have more information out there. I think the governor deserves credit um, for putting a, a lot of money in this budget to really begin groundwater monitoring and uh, in a much more systematic way statewide than we've done before, and. You know, I think we're getting the tools. I think things are lining up right. I, I think people are ready to have an uncomfortable conversation um, and be creative. I mean, and, and I think, you know, that's, I think the one thing that Tim and I share is sort of the sense of if we do lock ourselves in the room, we're actually all going to make it out the door together and we'll, uh, you know, we'll be okay. <laughs> we'll, uh, but, you know, but it does take that dynamic. It takes some willingness to be in an uncomfortable, wow, shoot, we're going to have to make hard decisions um, in order to make hard decisions. So. Okay, so we only have 10 minutes left, and I want to make sure that uh, lots of people get to ask questions to you guys. So I'm not, I'm not, so you have to be great. Right. So much be <laughs> late. I'll be so uh, quick. Um, uncomfortable conversations for uh, water users their economic water users generally mean they stop renting or But the other side of that is the uncomfortable conversation about endangered species. And in the context of climate change, in the context of the drought conditions that are like this going forward, um, don't we as reconciliation ecologists or conservationists have to come to the uncomfortable conversation of we can't save these species. These species are done as far as us being able to. What a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> Yeah, you know, um, so here's a thought where I'm perhaps not as optimistic about the political dialogue. When I was in Washington with Bruce Babbitt in the 1990s, we were working on an endangered species bill um, to really re kind of reform the act that would have allowed more flexibility. Um, I like that. Bill. In a way that looked at, uh, you know, actually being able to kind of get to a point where you say we're not going to be able to save the Delta smelt as a potential example. And what do you do? Um, and what do we do to improve the ecology of the system in a way that might give the smelt a chance, but doesn't put 100% of our resources into smelt at the expense of salmon as we start managing these systems back from jeopardy, which is the way the Endangered Species <laughs> Act tends to work. And um, the, the thing that I would say about Washington today is that even my organization, which kind of tries to work in a pretty centrist fashion with all stakeholders, we, we're very nervous about opening up a conversation about the Endangered Species Act right now because it is either take the act apart and effectively uh, make an economic decision on any conservation action uh, or, you know, the status quo. And we think we can kind of work with the status quo and work uh, to get habitat conservation plans done. And it's one of the reasons we've been spending as much time and energy as we have on the Bay Delta Conservation Plan. But, um, you know, uh, I'll say it. There's a, there's a day, not too far in the future, where we as responsible conservationists need to reopen the Endangered Species Act to look at habitat values in a more holistic way, rather than the sort of species by species conservation actions that we are 
driving today. And I, it's, I'm uncomfortable saying that because I am very uncomfortable getting into that conversation in Washington today. Before you move on, I, I, yeah. I, I, no, I, I, want, I want to make, do a plug for UC Davis. Uh, you guys here with this reconciliation ideas, I mean, this is a, a center of some of the most progressive thinking about how you think differently about the future that I'm aware of. Keep it up, because the regulators won't listen to me, but they will listen to you. And eventually, we, I represent an industry that, that thinks, oh, com, you might not believe this, but from my perspective, completely differently than they did 25 years ago when I, when I first joined it. We manage water very differently, much better. I, have, I perceive very little change in the mindset of the regulators that we deal with, and I don't think we get where, we're gonna go, where we need to go unless there's a mindset. I'm not saying we don't need to change our mindset more, uh, but we need a lot of mindset change from the people who have such power over this system, uh, which is, again, where, that's where Bruce Babbitt was coming from, and for a brief period of time, there was change that I, again, that, again, that I, don't, that I don't feel today. So keep it up here at UC Davis, keep pushing them in the right direction, and, 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 then, and then keep remembering my mother taught us all to be optimists and we need to do that. Bruce <laughs> <laughs> Davis is a favorite story. Yeah. So we were talking a lot about the, the San Joaquin Valley, and I was thinking about the San Joaquin River, and it's been talked a lot, and after the state of the state too, about whether or not the San Joaquin River restoration project is going to have to be mothballed for a while or pushed back or something like that. And you had mentioned that you know perhaps looking at increased storage or changing storage of groundwater supplies in the San Joaquin Valley is not the best place to put our investment because there's been so much subsidence, storage capacities have been decreased. Um, we've got the quote unquote Congress created dust bowl going on in a, the valley down there with a lot of growers just growing things that are economically good for them, but environmentally terrible for them also. Severely high in water demands. Do you think that those things are, can you restore the San Joaquin Valley, get more water to the farmers, actually have increased capacity of groundwater down there? Is that even a viable approach at this point? Is it more a matter of rethinking about the priorities for the system down there instead of moving forward with this restoration project? So I think you have to do both. I'm really one of those people for big, gnarly environmental goals to do things that are really exciting and outrageous. And, and one of the reasons I like the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, I want water from the Delta to be a lot more expensive than it is today. And that's <laughs> one of the things that will happen with the Bay Delta Conservation Plan. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> the, light, the light goes on. The other thing is restore the San Joaquin River. I mean, that's just, it's an inspirational, I mean, wow, to bring a river back. I mean, that's just one of those things that's exciting. And, and I don't think we can give up on that. And I don't think we have to give up on that. I do think we need to sensibly get together and decide where we follow land in the San Joaquin Valley to reduce overall demand. And I think we need, uh, you know, we got to get out of permanent crops um, uh, and that even though I know that, you know, the P&L is great, but uh, it's not sustainable. And we can do it. We can do it. We can more sensibly manage that water in the San Joaquin Valley and, and restore the San Joaquin River at the same time. I, I, I agree with the general optimism. I disagree with some of those prescriptions that were, uh, were there, but uh, the, the, it's got to be a comprehensive approach. My biggest concern about the San Joaquin River, and I tend to be, I, I'm like Jay, uh, I, I would like to see the river restored for whatever fisheries uh, can handle. If they can get salmon all the way up to, uh, uh, to Frying Dam, I'm all for it. But, uh, but it's got to be a comprehensive approach. For I I've got a lot of members down in that part of the world who are very bitter that everybody knows just releasing water and doing nothing else isn't going to do any good. Right. You have to release water. You have to spend a billion dollars on habitat improvements. That water's got to be interfaced into an integrated plan. And the integrated plan is not coming together. Uh, and yet the people still want the, the, the release of the water, which people can reasonably question if that, is that going to do any good. So it's got to be an integrated plan. I think we should set our, bar, our, our, our goals high on the San Joaquin River and elsewhere. You know, you know, I, I want something that the environmentalist next to me is willing to fight for just like I am. Earlier, some of the tough trade-offs between different types of endangered species, and I have a question that's 
um, related to water rights and tough trade-offs between different types of water users. So I, I work a lot on the San Joaquin Valley, and there's some call, some thoughts that this year might be a year we have to make a call on Friance and actually deliver water to the exchange contractors from Friant Dam. Scary we'll stuff, be, yeah. We won't be able to get enough out of Delta, which has never happened, ever. <laughs> Um, and so the consequence of that could be that all of Millerton Lake is drained to supply the exchange contractors their full exchange contract amount, and we don't have enough water left in the frying division to supply basic human health and safety water to small agricultural communities on the east side. And so my question is related to what opportunities do you think that there are in terms of realigning our water rights, or maybe through some water exchanges or um, various instruments to kind of realign the people that have water with the people that actually need water and our societal goals um, as a state. You each get one minute. Yeah. You really know your stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not a big fan of going in and trying to redo water rights. Uh, early in my career, Southern California said, should we just go and attack their water rights with whatever we can? I was one of the, I was a young economist, what did I know? I strongly argued no. I, th I thought that fight would be Armageddon. Uh, you re they, they really will do everything. I'm, I'm a big market guy. Uh, I, I, make their rights as firm as you can and then, and then get out your checkbook, get out society's checkbook. And uh, it's, it's not unusual, I know this sounds terrible, but it's not unusual to compensate vested people who are vested in an old system when you want to change that system. It's not unusual to compensate them so they get out of the way and lo allow the change to happen. Uh, that's, that's how we cleaned up our rivers. That's how we cleaned up our air. For some reason, in California water, uh, we, we, we don't do that nearly to the degree that I think that we should. So I'd leave the rights in place. I would get out my checkbook and I would start creating economic incentives <coughs> for people to do the right thing. Yeah, I think this uh, Klamath Basin water settlement um, in the uh, last half of last year is pretty instructive for all of us. And I kind of come at it from, boy, I used to really attack with zeal this idea of reallocating water rights. And I just think that is now, at that, in that case, it was a 20-year proposition. Um, and I think that that's, in, whenever you open that equation now, that's what you're looking at. And so I, I, I just can't see us getting around the corner of that. I, I, I really feel like we got to figure out a better incentive structure to manage water differently. Okay, so we're almost out of time. I do want to remind you that the students are going to take, the students in the class are going to take, uh, uh, take our speakers out to, uh, to dinner so you can continue this conversation. That was actually a question. Um, but here it is, okay? And you, can, you have to keep it to one sentence. Oh, okay. I don't like it when he gets a glint in his eye. Two sentences, because each of you now gets the chance to introduce state legislation and federal legislation today. That, that passes. Yeah. That actually, that has, to have a, that actually has to have a reasonable chance of passage. So, or, we're in fantasy land anyway. So, uh, yeah, what, 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 what state legislation, what federal legislation would you Today. And I don't care if it's for the drought or whatever. What would be at the top of your list? And give it a title, and that's all you get to say. <laughs> Family, it's got to be in this. <laughs> <laughs> Clean water, it's got to be in this. Infinite beauty flowers. <laughs> The, the California Family Sustainable Water Management. No, it doesn't work. So my, so my one sentence is, I want to integrate overall water supply use in California. Water, groundwater, and surface water, so that we are actually being honest about California's water resources dynamics in, in how we manage water resources. So, that's my state solution. Do we have to volley back and forth now? Yeah, why don't you give your state solution? Don't look. I think we did the legislative job in the state in 2009. We did it right. We should let it work. I do. My organization, like Jay's, strongly believes that we should pass the water bond that we agreed to back in 2009, which would be a stimulus for co-equal goals, uh, the way that, the, the way that I look at it. Um, in Washington, D.C., I don't know if there's any legislation that you could pass uh, uh, that, that you'd want to pass, but, but what I would like to accomplish is where the federal government is joining us in this concept of co-equal goals, yeah. of genuinely managing the system both for ecosystem restoration and for uh, water supply reliability for the economy yeah. that's left. So your federal wish 
Christmas wish. You know, I think that's it. I mean, I think that's very good. And and to and and that. Uh, You know, that, I think that's the most we could hope for. I mean, if we really brought integrity to California's overall water management in a way that was uh, where the federal policy came in to support it, and, and I think um, yeah, if there were some, in, you know, at this point, frankly, some investment in the system at the federal level, I guess to Tim's point, the water bond alone, I think, needs to be tweaked a bit to incentivize um, better long-term stewardship of water resources, but uh, I, I feel like there also has to be a, a, a federal catalyst to recognize that, that, that flies with it. For what it's worth, the federal catalyst is probably in the executive branch, not in the Congress. Yeah. I, do, I don't see the Congress being able to do anything. Um, but, but we truly need a Bruce Babbitt in the Obama administration that has that vision of making the system work for both the ecosystem and uh, the economy of the state of California and then pushes that huge bureaucracy uh, in a different direction than it would otherwise go. So draft Bruce Babbitt. He's available. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank our speaker.